This hearing will come to order. Good morning and welcome everyone. And to our witnesses, thank you for um, uh, letting us conduct a little uh, business here. Um, as was stated, several of our, uh, this is a busy time. We have several members in markups elsewhere. They will be coming back, um, uh, but their, uh, their staff is either here or in the anteroom watching. Uh, this will be televised, so we'll have a the opportunity for this to go out, and we appreciate you being here. Uh, water is an essential input to virtually everything we do, from growing and processing food to manufacturing the products we use today uh, to producing the energy we need to power our economy. Water is essential to all life and to maintain public health and the diversity and beauty of our environment. The recent droughts experienced in the West and the Southeast and increased competition for water supplies suggest that we must take a closer look at how we are managing our water resources. 36 states expect to experience significant water shortage by uh, 2013. Population growth, increased uh, per capita water use, degraded water quality, and climate change have all impacted our availability, our available supplies of water. In my district, water sources have dried up and wells have run dry. Towns have been forced to implement water restrictions to deal with a decreased supply. According to the Tennessee Valley Authority, the first eight months of 2007 were the driest in the last 118 years of Tennessee history. When severe water shortage occurs, the economic impact is substantial. In 2007, the Tennessee Valley Authority was forced to shut down a nuclear reactor due to a lack of acceptable cooling water in the Tennessee River. According to a 2000 report from NOAA, each of the eight water storage uh, or, or eight water shortages over the past 20 years from drought or heat waves resulted in one billion dollars or more in monetary losses. A recent report by J.P. Morgan indicated that a single production interruption at a semiconductor plant could cost 200 million dollars in lost revenue. I believe with investment in research and development, public education, and better information on the status of our water supplies, we can avoid the high costs, social disruption, and environmental damage associated with water sh shortage. Our committee has already begun to bring forward legislation to help us better utilize water resources. Last week, the Subcommittee on Energy and Environment reported bills by Mr. Representative Hall and Mr. Matheson to authorize research at the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection Agency on water treatment and to in increase the efficiencies of our water use. We will be looking for more opportunities to address this important issue. I would like to thank our panelists for appearing before us today to share with us their views on the problems we currently face in water supply and their suggestions for addressing these problems in the future. And I look forward to a lively discussion from this impressive panel. At this time, I would like to yield to my distinguished colleague from Texas, our ranking member, Mr. Hall, for an opening statement. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'm, of course, pleased that we're having this hearing here today. Water supply is, as you say, a very critical issue facing our country. Uh, water is the lifeblood of our economy. Every sector requires it and would be crippled without it. Energy and agriculture are the two largest consumers of water, I understand, but it's also a vital part of manufacturing, of fishing, obviously everyday living. Uh, water's importance to U.S. prosperity is one that's been discussed in various reports over the last decade, government-sponsored and private sector alike. It's hit home for some of us where our districts have been subjected to periods of long drought or massive flooding. Uh, this Congress is well aware of the dangers of water shortages and overabundance. Two years ago, we passed and the President signed the National Integrated Drought Information System Act of 2006. We did this in response to a need for a centralized location for drought information. I'm very pleased that Dr. Pulwardy is here to talk about it, although this law is not the only answer. It's part of the larger solution required for good water policy and good management. What we need are the proper tools and resources for local, state, and regional decision makers to adapt to changing conditions. And I look forward to hearing from the panelists today on possible solutions to our nation's water challenges. And I thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Hall, and thank you for your hospitality. Uh, we had a hearing down at Texarkana on the competes bill uh, uh, this uh, Monday, and, at, and it was very interesting and I think adds to our um, uh, uh, committee's institutional 
um, memory uh, and knowledge in this very important area. And I ask unanimous consent that all additional opening statements submitted by the committee members be included in the record without objection so ordered. It's my pleasure now to introduce the witnesses this morning. Dr. Stephen Parker is the director of the Water Science and Technology Board at the National Research Council. And Ms. Giffords, I would like to yield to you. Uh, somehow we always work Arizona into uh, most hearings, so you're up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a privilege for me to introduce a tremendous colleague from, um, from Arizona, Dr. John Overpeck, who is one of the brightest stars at the University of Arizona. Dr. Overpeck is a climate system scientist at the U of A, where he's also the director for the Institute for the, Planet, for the Study of Planet Earth, a professor of geosciences and a professor of atmospheric sciences. Dr. Overpeck has published over 120 papers in climate and the environmental sciences. He recently served as a coordinating lead author for the fourth assessment report of the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which shared the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize with former Vice President Al Gore. And I want to thank you and your colleagues for coming to present before our committee the, the reports from that very important document. For his interdisciplinary research, Dr. Overpeck has also been awarded the U.S. Department of Commerce Bronze and Gold Medals, as well as the Walter Orr Roberts Award of the American Meteorological Society. He has been a Guggenheim Fellow and serves on the board of reviewing editors for Science Magazine. Dr. Overpeck's research focuses on global change dynamics, with a major component aimed at understanding how and why key climate systems vary on timescales longer than seasons and years. Through his research, Dr. Overpeck is working to help foster a new paradigm of interdisciplinary knowledge creation between physical, biological, and social scientists, all with the goal of serving the environmental needs of society in a more effective manner. I'm very pleased to have Dr. Overpeck here. Are in Arizona, and I'm pleased to have a, such a distinguished panel, group of panelists to talk about an issue that is vitally important to the West and to our country. Thanks, Ms. Gifford. Uh, Dr. Wilkerson, I won't be quite as generous uh, with you, um, <laughs> but uh, no, no, nonetheless, you are very distinguished. Uh, you're the director of the Water Policy Program at the Brin School of Environmental Science and Management at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Welcome. And Dr. Or rather, Mr. Mark Levinson is the ec ec economist for the U.S. Corporate Research at J.P. Morgan Chase and author of J.P. Morgan's recent report, Watching Water, A Guide to Evaluating Corporate Risk in a Thirsty World. And finally, um, our witness is Dr. Roger Pulwarty, uh, director, uh, Program Director for the National Integrated Drought Information System at NOAA Climate Program Office. Uh, as we've told you, uh, each uh, we would like for you, uh, you're not, we're not going to bring out the guillotine, but we would like for you to try to keep your opening statement to about five minutes, and your written testimony will be made a part of the record. And when, the question, or when you're completed with your testimony, we will have questions by our, um, by our members here. So, Dr. Parker, uh, please begin. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, and others. I'm Stephen Parker from the National Research Council, and I'm pleased to participate in today's hearing. I, I've been in my position at the Water Science and Technology Board for 26 years and have overseen about 200 studies relevant to today, today's topic. Uh, thus, my remarks are, are general and drawn from our body of work, not one particular recent study. Uh, it is hard to overstate the importance of high-quality water supplies to our nation. Yet in many areas, supplies are essentially fixed and the quality is deteriorating. At the same time, demands for water to support population and economic growth, the environment, and other purposes continue to increase. Examples of the mounting array of water-related problems exist in every region of the country, especially the west and southwest. Both of these regions have rapidly growing populations and have been affected by climate variability, drought, and a tightening water supply picture as many new users vie for limited supplies and call for changes to traditional allocation rules. Lasting solutions to these challenges of water supply and demand and water quality will require creative science-based strategies and innovative water technologies. I have phrased my central concerns in the form of four questions. If the answers to some of these questions are no, I fear that we may be in for a national water crisis, something like that portrayed in the media. My question one, will there be sufficient water to support both future economic and population growth while sustaining ecosystems? 
The fast-growing Southwest and Southeast face great challenges in meeting increasing water demands. Most of the sources and supplies of water for these regions are fully allocated among environmental, urban, and agricultural uses. Unfortunately, the nation seems lacking in a long-term strategic vision of alternative means for accommodating growth with existing supplies. We believe the nation has underinvested in research and development needed to help municipalities augment water supplies in this post-dam building era. For example, through wastewater reuse, desalination, uh, and other approaches including aquifer storage and recovery. Question two, how effectively can our water management systems and institutions adapt to climate change? Existing data reveals some significant climate changes in the U.S. in recent years. Warmer temperatures in some regions and potential impacts on water supplies are of special concern. Although there are uncertainties regarding future climate projections, there is broad scientific agreement that rising temperatures are having a number of effects, such as earlier melting of snowpack, which affects agricultural production, increases flood risks, and is forcing changes in reservoir operations. Two, higher sea levels, which will increase salinity in coastal water supply aquifers and alter marshes and wetlands. And three, and changing amounts of precipitation and extreme climatic events. My question three, will drinking water be safe? Over the past 100 years, investments in water treatment and distribution infrastructure has made the quality of U.S. drinking water among the best in the world. Today, we take safe water for granted. Nevertheless, new chemicals and biological agents continue to emerge, and intentional or unintentional contamination of drinking water supplies represents a real and continuing threat. Additionally, much of our urban drinking water infrastructure is reaching the end of its expected lifetime and will need to be replaced in the next 25, 10 to 25 years. Question four, can existing water policies effectively respond to present and future challenges? Many of the nation's water policies and practices were created and designed for yesterday's water resources challenges and are becoming obsolete. For example, the National Environmental Policy Act, the Clean Water Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act, and the Endangered Species Act were all passed in the early 70s. Likewise, many dam operators and water allocation plans uh, are designed for a set of users in an earlier era and are being challenged by increasing demands from users such as recreational, urban, and environmental interests. It seems important that the nation's water man management institutions and body politic stay vi vigilant to assure and perhaps restore modern and appropriate management and legal instruments to meet the challenges. The case is compelling for governmental leadership and support for water resources research and maintenance of strong governmental, scientific, and techno technical ca capabilities. My written statement discusses numerous examples of past federally funded water research that have produced significant payoffs to the nation. The advances in water science and technology that society is now requiring are likely to be inadequate if federal action is not taken as the states and non-governmental organizations have limited resources to invest in required research. That concludes my statement. I commend the committee for recognizing the importance of water resources and the role of the government in water resources to the nation. I hope you act quickly and strategically, as I often worry that we are living on borrowed water capacity created by conservative engineers in the past and that our water supply cushion is disappearing. I'd be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Parker. And uh, uh, Dr. Overpeck, you're recognized. Chairman Gordon, Ranking Member Hall, Congresswoman Giffords, and other distinguished members of the committee, I thank you for allowing me to come and discuss these issues with you today. One of our chief potential challenges to ensuring reliable water supply will be climate variability and also climate change. And it appears likely that both climate variability and climate change are already starting to challenge water supply in parts of our country. Significant parts of our nation are currently in drought. Droughts in the West, Central Plains, Texas, and the Southeast all vie for title of the worst current drought. These droughts now occurring in the U.S. are, however, 
modest compared to the severe natural droughts that took place before the 20th century. For example, Western North America has seen 25-year and much longer mega droughts in just the last thousand years. It's safe to say that if water supply infrastructure in many parts of our country, for example, the West, uh, were to see such a drought, it would be overwhelmed today. However, what is most disturbing about these natural mega droughts of the past is that we are not sure what caused them, nor are we confident that we can predict them. It's just a matter of time before we'll get another mega drought, and this means that we should think seriously about making our society more resilient in the face of mega drought. Now I'd like to turn to the issue of climate change. The climate system is changing, very likely due to humans. And this change could also pose another major challenge to water supply in parts of our nation. Parts of our country have already warmed more than 2 degrees Fahrenheit in the last century and could warm another 15 or more degrees by the end of the century if we don't do something to curb emissions of greenhouse gases. The warming has already led to substantial decreases in spring snowpack which in turn have led to decreased flow in some major river systems in the United States, including the Colorado River. Current river flow estimates for some parts of the country, for example, the Colorado River, that serves seven states and over 30 million people, indicates that water supply could be greatly reduced by mid-century or before. In addition, uh, the latest climate change science indicates that much of the coterminous U.S. could see an increase in the annual maximum number of consecutive dry days between rainfall events, a decrease in average soil moisture, and an increased likelihood of drought. Although the projected changes are less certain outside the West and Southwest, the current state of climate science suggests that they, these all should be considered real possibilities for the future. What then can we do about this challenge? Fortunately, there are some no regrets actions that can be taken regardless of cause, natural or climate change. We need an accelerated effort to understand climate-related water supply variabilities, both physical, biological, and social. For example, we must incorporate realistic assessments of future climate change into water management models that are being used to assess future supply change. Also, groundwater serves as a major buffer during times of drought. We must try and determine how much groundwater really exists locally under, around our country and how quickly this groundwater can be recharged in the future, both by precipitation and human mechanisms. And lastly, we need to determine, for example, how much water can be diverted safely from agriculture, another important buffer in times of drought, to uses that support population growth in potentially water-limited regions. Number two. We need an accelerated effort to understand climate change variability, climate variability, and climate change processes, as well as how to predict them. Essential progress can be accelerated via greater funding of basic, for example, National Science Foundation, and use inspired, for example, NOAA, DOE, and NASA climate research, observation, and modeling. Number three, we need a national climate service that is designed to support local and regional decision makers in dealing with climate-related reductions in water supply. Finally, in addition to no regrets options that I've just summarized, there is also the option of mitigating or reducing the likely impacts of climate change on U.S. water supply. If we wish to forestall, for sure, potential major climate change threats to water supply, large reductions in greenhouse gas emissions namely 80 percent below 1990 levels by 2050 must be initiated soon. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Overpeck and Dr. Uh, Wilson. Uh, Wil Wilkerson, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Gordon, members of the committee, I appreciate the opportunity to share some thoughts with you today. I've got some PowerPoints and I'll try to click through them quickly. Let me start with uh, the four points I'd like to make. Uh, integrated policy and planning, I'm going to pitch, and I have in my written testimony, that uh, we couple the science and technology uh, assets that we have with uh, policy uh, processes. 
multiple benefit strategies, designs for flexibility, and put it all in the climate change context. This is uh, a map of total water withdrawals in the U.S., and I'll draw your attention to the little mountains off on the right-hand side of the picture. Most of those are thermal power plants. I was asked to address the water energy nexus, uh, and so there's a differentiation here uh, between the east and the west to some extent as to uh, what we're withdrawing water for in different areas. Many water systems in the U.S. are already over-allocated and stressed. Every major supply system in California is already over allocated. Here's the population growth map and water resources and you can see even in areas that are marked in blue in terms of water resources when we look at the drought monitor for the US and Jonathan has in his presentation the same map for uh, two months later almost exactly uh, drawn from the, uh, the current uh, map here in May and it looks almost identical so you can see some of that uh, tremendous drought in the southeast uh, is occurring in areas that uh, until recently many thought were wet and, and somewhat uh, uh, immune to the same kind of droughts. Nearly 20 years ago two of the stars in the, in the field of climate science, Roger Revell and Paul Wagoner, made a very important uh, observation. Governments at all levels should reevaluate legal, technical, and economic procedures for managing water resources in the light of climate changes that are highly likely. Indeed, we're seeing those changes unfold, and we need to visit, again, our institutions and legal frameworks, as well as our science and technical capacity. Just a quick little bit of history where we were only 50 years ago in our thinking about water resource management. This is a map of North America. You'll see in the upper left the water collection region coming down through the water transfer region. It was thought that uh, Oregon and Washington didn't need much. And we'll distribute it down in the southwest and be very generous right on across the Mexican border. And you'll see in the middle of the picture the optional water distribution region, maybe even share some there. This was a serious plan. Uh, here's the plumbing for that plan, and that was the way we were thinking about managing water through interbasin transfers uh, only 50 years ago. A lot of thinking has changed from the idea of building facilities uh, in the West, in particular with uh, surface storage, with conveyance systems. We have some remarkable engineering and remarkable systems. Uh, but we're having difficulty with the match between hydrology and uh, those systems providing for our needs. What we need is integrated whole system approaches to water and energy management in the context of science and technology, of climate change, economics, and environmental concerns. We need policy strategies that are designed to tap multiple benefits and are flexible in the face of changing circumstances. So let me briefly go through then some energy observations here. About 19% of California's electricity, I'm going to focus here on California if I may, and about a third of our natural gas it goes to water. In fact, water is the top use of electricity in California. Now our systems, as you can see, groundwater and local water projects actually provide the majority of water but we have major uh, plumbing facilities as well. I'll run you through the state project very quickly. That's the red line on this map. Here's all the pumping plants for that system. Here's one of them, the largest pumping plant in the world. That's only half of it uh, at the foot of the Tehachapi Mountains. And this is what it looks like as we plot out all of the energy inputs to those systems. Putting that on a bar chart, the red bars are the interbasin transfer points, including the Colorado River Aqueduct and the State Water Project, you'll note that they exceed ocean water desalination in terms of energy intensity already. Energy intensity is the total amount of energy embodied in water used in a particular place. We run through a calculation. California has been doing quite a bit of this work now to figure out every step in that water process and then to understand opportunities to uh, manage it differently. Here's one of the largest uses, as you can see, single families for the U.S., not just California, and then going to the, uh, that half that's residential, uh, half of that is outdoors, half is indoors. Here is California's uh, official state water plan, and here are the sources of water for the next quarter century, and I'll draw your attention to the bar on the right. Urban water use efficiency, doing something about that water use on the demand side is where we expect to get most of our water in the future, along with conjunctive management and recycled water. Those are the big ones. 
I'm going to skip through because my time's out, but here are some of those opportunities uh, for water management that are going to provide the new water supplies, at least according to our state planning process in California. Coupled to that is capturing stormwater uh, in different techniques that are uh, often simple but very effective, recycling water, going to high-tech uh, filtration reverse osmosis uh, for different sources, uh, and then going to the flip of that very quickly, the water intensity of energy, actually uh, energy, thermal energy facilities are the largest use of uh, water withdrawn in, in the United States along with agriculture, uh, over a third and about a th a three percent of total consumption. The federal labs are doing a lot of work on this. Uh, analysis uh, is indicating that we've got lots of opportunities to produce energy with very little or no water, and we have other opportunities uh, that uh, use tremendous amounts of water. So we have choices to make. Quick conclusions then. Water scarcity and quality will remain key issues. Vast opportunities do exist, though, for efficiency improvements. Science and technology are critically important in addressing water supply quality challenges but policy design and implementation is equally as important. So integrated whole system planning uh, and designing policies and infrastructure for flexibility and multiple benefits. I posed two questions in my written testimony. Uh, how can we decouple water and energy systems where there are high cost stresses, damages, or vulnerabilities to systems? And how can we maximize water and energy efficiency and productivity so as to maximize uh, benefits to society? Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Wilkerson. And Mr. Levinson, you're recognized. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's quite an honor for me to be with such a distinguished panel today. Uh, I'm going to speak about water supply risks and their impact on investors. First, uh, it might help that if I explain exactly where I fit in uh, the Wall Street ecosystem. Uh, I specialize in economic issues. Uh, including environmental regulation. And my clients are institutional investors who buy publicly traded stocks and bonds. Uh, I say that to make clear that I have no connection whatsoever to our mergers and acquisitions business or to the lending business or to the many other things that an investment bank does. Uh, in my opinion, investors are much less concerned about water supply risks than they should be. We recently published a report to which the chairman alluded uh, contending that water supply risks are far more important to many companies than investors believe. We also found that very few companies are fully aware of these risks. A lot of companies now produce PR brochures that talk about how they're reducing water use per unit of output, but almost none of these companies thoroughly assesses what we call its water footprint, which is the total usage of water in its supply chain clear through to the consumption of its products. Investors really have no way of evaluating the risk of business disruption uh, due to water scarcity or of comparing risks among companies. We think these risks take three forms. One is physical risk. That's the most obvious. This is the risk to which the chairman alluded earlier that occurred with uh, the Browns Ferry reactor last year. It simply had to be shut down because there was not enough water uh, in uh, the Tennessee River to cool it adequately. The second uh, is um, a, a different situation. It's regulatory risk. Regulatory risk involve government decisions to allocate and price water in response to scarcity. Perhaps the best U.S. example occurred in 2001 when lack of water in the Columbia and Snake Rivers caused the Bonneville Power Administration to curtail electricity sales to aluminum smelters in Montana, Oregon, and Washington. In the short run, aluminum production plummeted in the U.S. In the long run, the aluminum industry is leaving the region because regulators responded to water scarcity by raising the price of a key input, electricity. In 2001, there were 10 aluminum smelters in the Northwest. Today, there are three still operating. The third set of corporate risks is reputational. In a number of places around the world, consumers are taking environmental considerations into account in deciding which goods and services to buy, and we think companies that are perceived as bad actors face a serious risk of consumer backlash. The uh, risks of water scarcity, of course, are not evenly spread through the economy. Uh, in addition to semiconductors and power generation, water sensitivity is particularly acute in food processing and in oil and gas production. 
I think food processing risks are well known to people, perhaps less so in oil and gas, where there's now a lot of interest in shale formations. Shale rock uh, contains very small pores. Basically, the uh, oil or gas cannot migrate to the well readily. The way this oil is recovered is by injecting uh, large amounts of water under high pressure, a technology called uh, fracture uh, stimulation. This uh, runs uh, afoul of, of the lack of water in many places, and, and so the lack of water is actually inhibiting the recovery of oil that would otherwise be available. The committee asked me what the federal government might do to facilitate the equitable and efficient allocation of water supplies, and I wanted to give you three thoughts here. First, if you look at overall U.S. water consumption, it's actually been fairly flat, but, but there's some disturbing trends. Uh, an increasing share of this consumption comes from groundwater, which suggests that surface water resources have been tapped out. Irrigation accounts for about two-thirds of U.S. groundwater withdrawals. And this share is probably growing. Uh, I would uh, point out that uh, the effort to uh, increase production of ethanol actually increases the draw on groundwater by encouraging the planting of corn and, and other crops in fairly arid regions where it has to be irrigated. Uh, there are more than 100,000 irrigation wells in the United States, and only one-seventh of them, according to the Agriculture Department, only one in seven irrigation wells has a meter on it. If something's not metered, it's not being paid for. It, and there's very little incentive to conserve something that you're getting for free. So uh, I, I would suggest that here's an area for the uh, committee to look at. I understand that state law rather than federal law governs groundwater, but excessive use of groundwater clearly affects interstate commerce. And, and so there's a federal interest here. Uh, and it, in my view, it would be useful for Congress to encourage the states to apply methods of pricing groundwater withdrawals to stimulate conservation. This should apply not just to agriculture, but to all groundwater withdrawals. A second subject in which congressional involvement might be useful is localized water treatment. Almost all of our public supplies are now treated centrally. As a result, we're using drinking water to water roses and wash down parking lots. This represents a huge waste of resources. There's now a lot of work going on at decentralized, developing decentralized water treatments. This is uh, in the R&D stage by many private companies. Uh, it might be an area in which federal research funds or changes in federal water treatment regulations uh, would be helpful. Uh, there's one other subject I want to touch on, and that is power generation. I know there's a lot of talk on Capitol Hill now about federal loans or guarantee programs for new generation nuclear plants and for coal plants with carbon capture and sequestration. Both of these technologies require large amounts of water. I think it important that the social cost of these large water withdrawals be reflected in the prices users pay for the electricity from these plants. It's just bad policy for the government to be subsidizing water usage, and this applies to power plants as much as to agriculture and other industries. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Levinson. And Mr. Perwarty, you're, uh, Dr. Perwarty, you're Thank you. uh, recognized. Good morning, Chairman Gordon, Ranking Member Hall, and the members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to speak with you today on the National Integrated Drought Information System and its role in addressing some of our water supply challenges in the 21st century. My name is Roger Pulwarty. I'm a climate scientist in the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the director of the National Integrated Drought Information System, or NIDAS, program. I've also been fortunate to be a lead author on the adaptation in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Fourth Assessment Report and on the recently released IPCC Technical Report on climate and water resources, the results of which I was fortunate to have presented before this committee last year. As is widely acknowledged, drought is not a purely physical phenomenon, but is an interplay between water availability and the needs of humans and the environment. Drought is slow in onset, and its effects, such as impacts on energy, including hydropower, tourism, and commodity markets, can continue to be felt long after an event is over. As outlined in Public Law 109-430, NIDAS is envisioned to serve as an early warning information system for managing drought-related risks in the 21st century. Impetus for information services to support federal, state, and local responses has risen from ongoing concerns over water security and scarcity, as mentioned before in the Southwest since 1999, in the Southeast since early 2007, along with declining water levels in the three largest Great Lakes since the late 1980s. A great deal of progress has been made since the NIDAS program was established in December 2006, 
A national interagency and interstate program implementation team has been developed. The web-based drought portal was launched in November 2007, and it now provides comprehensive national level information on ongoing drought conditions and emerging conditions. NOAA and NIDAS are accelerating their improvements of operational climate forecasts and information on past droughts tailored to watersheds and local scales, such as the upper basin of the Colorado and the southeast, including Tennessee, Georgia, Florida, Alabama, and the Carolinas. NIDAS works through numerous federal agencies, tribes, states, and local governments. As such, there is significant leveraging of existing observing system infrastructure and products such as the Drought Monitor to provide improved data streams at the level of detail needed for decision making at watersheds, Colorado Basin, and at regional scales such as the Southeast. Data and predictions are by themselves insufficient to ensure adaptation and flexibility in the water resources sector. A hallmark, no pun intended, of NIDAS is the provision of decision support tools and training coupled with the ability of users to report local conditions back to the portal. Near-term activities include tailoring of the drought portal to add locally specific data and information at the watershed and county levels. Water managers are already explicitly considering how to incorporate the potential effects of a changing climate into specific designs. For example, in the California Southern Metropolitan Water District in Seattle and Las Vegas, adaptive management measures have been undertaken. But the barriers to implementing adaptive measures include the inability of some natural systems to adapt at the rate of combined demographic pressures and climate. Understanding and quantifying our water demands and impediments to the flow of timely and reliable information relevant for decision making. Climate services designed to support adaptation, of which NIDAS is an example, will be important in coping with current and future extremes and their effects on water resources, regardless of how that change is derived. As part of their drought management, municipalities and state agencies will have improved climate information and forecasts at key entry points for allocating domestic and industrial water usage. Water resource managers will have access to more detailed information on low flow conditions when balancing irrigation and hydropower with the needs of wildlife and flows to support coastal economies. Emergency declarations can now better reach out to those communities in need of assistance with improved information on the aerial extent and severity of developing droughts. So while per capita water use is declining in some parts of the country, trends in demand, observational records, and climate projections provide abundant evidence that our freshwater resources are vulnerable. Priorities for drought early warning information and decision support tools to prepare our nation for these challenges requires a mixed portfolio of approaches, including enhancing the networks of systematic observations of key elements in the human, ecological, and physical systems, including monitoring groundwater and vegetation stress. Promoting drought plans that maintain state sovereignty but responds to the needs of shared watersheds, including developing transboundary monitoring and early warning information for our internationally shared watersheds with our neighbors to the north and the south. Developing drought information impact assessment tools that include the cost and benefits of various adaptations and changing water demands. And finally, developing usable drought management triggers for specific planning thresholds and scenarios in agriculture, water, energy, and the coast. So the challenges of managing water supplies to meet social, economic, and environmental needs requires matching what we do with what we actually know. NIDAS offers the nation a mechanism to achieve this service requirement by providing a basis for integrating drought monitoring, research, and information for decision support. Thank you for inviting me to testify at this hearing today, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Pulwardi. At this point, we will open our first round of questions. The chair recognizes himself for five minutes. Uh, when I was... Um, Growing up, my father used to tell me about how really his life and, and, and life on our farm changed when the rural electrification uh, came out there. At that time, we had a good well. That's how we got our water. And at my other grandparents, we had a good spring. And everybody had their own little tin can down at the, or, uh, at the, or cup, rather, down at the spring. Uh, but those times have gone. Even if you have a spring or a well, they probably are going to be contaminated now. And so, um, Particularly in rural America, and when I say rural America, I'm not talking about way out farms like, like, like we were. I'm talking about even small little subdivisions right outside of town. Uh, oftentimes, uh, they don't have water, and as we call it, toting water uh, is, a, is, a, is something that many, many Americans are doing right now. And constantly folks are telling me, well, you know, rural, uh, the, the, the water line is within a mile of our home, you know, but we can't get it the rest of the way. So this is a real problem. Uh, it's a problem, but as you pointed out, with the nexus of, of water and energy uh, and in manufacturing. Uh, 
wars have been fought and they will continue to be fought over war over water and, and probably more so uh, in in the future so what i would like to do is using your cumulative wisdom is to get some suggestions on a federal role you've already if any and you've given us some of those ideas but what i, I want to be more narrow in the sense that this committee really only has jurisdiction over um, federal uh, research and development, I think, in, in this area. And so I think we've been done a pretty good job of trying to take good ideas and build a consensus and move them forward. So what I'd like for you to do, uh, what I might say in the, in the longer term, when you leave here, I want you to, if you would, submit back to us uh, any suggestions you might have uh, that this committee uh, can do. But right now, I'd like to hear, hear you cumulatively talk about one, two, or three of the maybe most significant things that this committee could uh, come forward with in terms of federal R&D. Uh, Mr. Matheson and Mr. Hall already have a bill on that, and we'd like to see how that, you know, that role could be expanded. So I will open the floor to whoever wants to start off. Anyone want to start? I said you need to do your microphone. There, we go. I do. there you go. Thanks. Um, without any doubt, research and development can play a huge role in how we manage our water. I think what's really uh, a potential biggest problem is what we don't know. Uh, we don't know what water lies underground. We don't really know how to predict what kind of uh, stream flows will occur in the future or groundwater infiltration in the future at the scales that are important for decision makers, at the scale of your farm or watershed. Um, we don't know how climate is going to vary in the future with a, enough precision to be able to forecast it. And we don't know how climate change is going to affect our water reserves. So all of these things require more research and development to get clear answers so that we develop um, our country and, and move populations around and grow in a way that is sensible and makes sense with regards to our, our true water supply. And I think my colleagues will talk about also, as we start to develop new energy economy, that has to take into account water. Water is far more valuable, I think, than many of our citizens realize. And we have to provide the underlying framework for making uh, good decisions. And I think much of that is research and development. And I applaud the bill that your colleague has uh, put together, your colleagues, uh, I think it's very important to be looking at efficiency and conservation because certainly we can save a lot of water that way. Thank you. I'd like to uh, uh, compliment you on the creation of this H.R. 3957 bill that I was handed. Uh, I, I was just scanning it and uh, uh, realize that it covers everything from water pricing for conservation and water u reuse for efficiency of use of the resource. Uh, I think Dr. Wilkinson mentioned um, uh, water reclamation in California and the use of um, perhaps dual systems and the uh, uh, use of uh, water of various um, uh, qualities for various purposes. Now it's a infrastructure challenge, but I think we better be heading in that direction, particularly in the arid west where uh, I think the um, availability of the resource probably uh, uh, may is, is becoming a limiting factor as to the economy that can be. Anyone right. else? I think it's a okay. terrific bill. Well, Mr. Matheson, being from Utah, has a firsthand uh, interest and knowledge of that. Just quickly, I think there's some obvious opportunities in technology uh, development uh, for efficiency. We've come a long way just in the last decade or two with the efficiency of a lot of plumbing fixtures and a lot of other opportunities for laser leveling of fields and irrigation technologies and the rest. So I think there's a long way to go and there's a lot of opportunities there. The other is water efficiency of our energy systems. What can we do to develop energy systems that require less water or no water and how can we develop portfolios of energy systems that take pressure off of our water systems. I think those two are, are uh, important areas. Finally, filtering technology. A lot of our water now with concerns about pharmaceuticals and the rest is going to be treated uh, to greater degrees and looking for efficient ways to use water and to filter and treat it in ways that meet uh, the health standards that we all want to see, uh, but do that efficiently. I think it's going to be very important. 
probably abide by the rules here too. So does anyone else have a real quick suggestion? Uh, yes, sir. Um, I did want to uh, touch on the point that water availability is not simply an engineering issue and an issue of R&D. And I think that while a committee clearly doesn't have a tax jurisdiction, the committee can do a great deal to bring into public discussion the point that water is in fact a scarce resource and, and needs to be priced. Because frankly, without pricing, uh, the possibilities are quite limited. Uh, the uh, Department of Agriculture. But, but right now, with our limited, you know, we'll, we'll cure the world's ills uh, later, but I'm trying to be more specific to what we can do from this committee right now. Are uh, you had any suggestions? Uh, yes, I, I think that to, while, while certainly there's pr a need to promote conservation technology, and that's all well and good, you really also have, have uh, a bully pulpit here to use uh, in order to, to make clear that this is a scarce resource and that there does need to be action on the pricing front if we're actually going to have conservation. We're going to have a variety of hearings that we hope to do that. Mr. Perwati, did you have anything you want to add? One of the major issues is uh, developing some of the new technologies, not only for efficiency, but for the transfer of technology into practice. And I think the bills make that case. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, um, you know, I, there, there will be a point where we're going to have, as was pointed out, a, a mega drought or other problem that will bring the whole Congress, the presidency, all together for a you know, water program. And what happens oftentimes is that's, you know, the cow is out of the barn. Um, but I think that, so what, what I hope that we can do is lay a foundation with R&D so that at that time we can really start to implement it. Cause it um, and so, again, what I would request that you do is um, get back to the committee. Uh, any, any suggestions in that area um, that you think, again, that, that, that there is um, either a legislative role or a role for us to uh, request different agencies to um, to be involved, uh, and that will we will then try to take those ideas and uh, build a consensus and do some good work here. Uh, Miss uh, Johnson is recognized for five minutes. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, Mr. Hall is recognized for five minutes. I'd always yield to Miss Johnson. She wanted me to, but let me get mine behind us here. Uh, and thanks for that peep into your background. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I enjoyed that. No telling how good you could have done if you'd had a more opportunity as a young man. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, you know, one old reference that I've always heard, and any time you get a speech as long as 15 or 20 minutes, someone always refers to water and fire as wonderful friends but fearful enemies. And we've sure experienced that uh, on more than one time on the plains of Texas and then the drought that we had and then the over availability of water. So I guess, uh, Mr. Parker, uh, uh, availability is important. It's also important to manage it. So I'd ask uh, Dr. Parker, we have to operate on information and knowledge. And what, how would you compare the information and technology available to water managers in the United States to those in other nations that face similar problems to what we face? I'd say the short answer is I think we've got better information. I think that uh, there are nations such as Germany that we might be lagging behind in terms of pushing innovative, alternative, green technologies, that, that, that kind of thing. But in terms of the hydrologic information, et cetera, I think we're a little better off. Well, you very ably pointed out, I think, in your testimony that when you discussed water quality and how it's improved since the passage of some of several federal uh, water laws or water acts, uh, uh, what else can we do to ensure the quality and, uh, and security of our water supply? Uh, we've got you here to testify, and, and the chairman and others here will take your testimony, study it, and other, it's, uh, everything you say is available to every member of Congress because of the court reporter that's taking it down somewhere here that will report it. Uh, how, uh, what, what else can we do to ensure uh, the quality and security of, of our water supply? We can pass laws. What's the next step? 
I uh, actually edited it out of my spoken testimony some uh, ideas about non-point source pollution, uh, which is um, it, it's not only a technical and a management issue, but it's also a, a legal issue in the sense that where I uh, referred to some of our uh, laws and practices as becoming obsolete, there's a prime example of, uh, of a, an issue that isn't dealt with very well within the uh, in the um, legislation um, we, we've done some work for um, for EPA now this isn't the probably the appropriate thing for me to say uh, advising them on urban water supply system security um, they have a research program in Cincinnati it's a very good one it's underfunded it, uh, it ought to be well supported. It was driven by concerns about uh, deliberate acts of harm to water supply systems. They're doing good work. Uh, it has um, broad application beyond uh, the terrorism uh, context, but I think it's kind of a hand-to-mouth uh, operation that each year has to fight for the limited resources. It seems it seems underappreciated to me, if, to the extent that you have any influence over that. I thank you. Uh, quickly, uh, uh, Dr. Pulwarty, uh, one of the benefits of NIDAS that you described in your testimony is that farmers would be better positioned to make decisions on which crops to plant and when to plant them. Now, given the overwhelming incentives we passed last year for biofuels and and the reference to other crops that they ought to plant and, and uh, those that planted other crops, including corn, followed the market and the the increase in, in reception of, of the benefits of planting that. Have you seen caution or hesitation on the part of farmers to, to plant fuel crops after seeing the information that NIDAS has provided, or is the monetary incentive overwhelming the risk of the natural environment? Got, got an answer for that? The latter. That's a good answer, and I think my time's up. Thank you. You, you are a very good witness. Um, now the gentlelady from Texas is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to the uh, panel, I chair the subcommittee of Water Resources and Development on, ta on Transportation and Infrastructure, and we are dealing a great deal with supply. And uh, I notice... And I'm wondering uh, what 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 about the um, temperature change affects water supply or quality or quantity? Uh, well, temperature certainly has temperature. Thanks. Temperature change certainly has a major effect on a water supply. As temperature goes up, there's a increase, and it's not a linear increase, in the amount of uh, moisture that the atmosphere can hold. So the, the atmosphere will demand more moisture. And where will it get that moisture? It'll get it from uh, soil. It'll get it from forests. It'll get them from agricultural plants. It'll get them from reservoirs. It'll get them from any open source of water. And it'll draw that water out. So. These temperature changes that are coming uh, are, are huge, just gigantic, and they will demand a lot of water, and they will make the droughts of the past look pale because they'll be so much hotter. Yes. I wanted to compliment Dr. Weber's statement. One of the impacts on temperature is on snowpack. And what we've seen not only in terms of early runoff, there has been an impact on the actual quality, the amount of snow, water that is in the snow. In 2005, 2006, on the upper Colorado, we received 105% of precipitation. Because of the dryness before that and because of the warmth of that spring, that stream flow of 105% of precipitation was reduced to about 70% of the reliable stream flow. We've been seeing that in different years based on temperature due to evaporation and sublimation and vegetation stress. 
Now, I know that every major body of water in this country is contaminated, and I also note that we have a shortage of expertise in um, addressing uh, this issue, and we've dealt with that somewhat in this committee because we know there is such a shortage of science and uh, math engineering uh, students. I'm wondering how would you determine that um, we would address many of the problems now as it relates to the research here uh, with such a shortage of people, of qualified people? Well, you know, I think this goes back to uh, Congressman Hall's question. I mean, between the United States and other countries of the world, our advantage is that we're an advanced country. And that means that we ought to be able to bring to bear uh, much more knowledge. Knowledge is power. But it's not just knowledge, uh, power for a country. It's a power for every individual who has to make decisions in their day-to-day -day life about water. And so we really need programs that educate everybody, not just the water managers, but the people who use water, because so many of the solutions will require cooperation of the citizens of the United States and that we work together. There are huge di d discrepancies between the per-person water use in cities in the West that really are astounding, and we need to learn how to use our very valuable water treasure more, more carefully. Thank you very much. I um, am doing a series of cable shows on uh subjects to try to begin to educate the public. Um, and, and one of the major questions I still have is how do we pay for all of this? We're, we're looking at creating a dedicated fund or maybe our um, economists. If, 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 if I may, being the economist in the room. Uh, two, two thoughts on this. One is that a, a lot this all doesn't have to be in the, the public sector. There is, in certain areas, uh, a lot of potential for private investment in water conservation if it pays off. And, and I you know, hate to sound like a broken record, but to a certain extent you get, get back into pricing here because that's what makes it interesting for people to buy conservation equipment. And to the extent that there's a demand for water conservation, there will be a lot of private initiative in developing uh, ways to conserve water and process technologies in particular industries, for example, or improving irrigation or, or that sort of thing. And, and there will be uh, private people paying for this R&D. It doesn't have to be done by the government. Uh, and, and second, to the extent that it's priced, part of the, the, the amount that people pay for water can, in fact, be used for public sector research and public sector infrastructure in this area. Thank you, uh, Thank you Mr. Much. Levinson. And uh, Mr. Robacher. You're recognized. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, coming from California, I certainly understand the significance of what's been uh, uh, presented to us today. Uh, we live on an, uh, in a desert that goes right up to the ocean, and a lot of times we forget about that. And uh, James Mulholland and uh, other great champions of California uh, are well known and appreciated. And uh, I wonder. If we are, our generation is going to have create a better future as the Mulhollands did for us in the past. Um, Mr. Wilkinson, uh, let me just ask you, and I did really appreciate your detailed uh, uh, analysis of the California situation. Uh, what, uh, um, just this year, uh, in the last couple of years, have we had trouble with snow, uh, snowfall in California? Yes, indeed. We did. Um, do? Okay, tell me about it. Do we is the snowpack and I understand the snowpack in the Sierra Nevada is actually higher this year than it was. Well, it, there we have uh, considerable variability. We had good snowpack uh, earlier in the year. For the last two months, we've had very little, and actually it started quite late. I took my graduate students up to uh, Yosemite. Uh, in December, and we drove across the pass over the mountains. There's virtually no snow at all in early December. Normally, of course, in we'd December? have in December. Normally, right. we'd have okay. a lot of snow. But between early December, then when it started snowing, and uh, about two months ago, we got a pretty good snowpack. And, and, uh, and on the average, is is it higher this year than last year? It's a little bit. It's a little bit below the 
the average level, but not a huge amount. The problem is that with very little for the last two months, we're now facing very serious water situation. Of course, you probably know last week they did the snow survey at the summit uh, by Echo Lake and, and they were walking on, on uh, soil. There was virtually no snow. Uh, so it's, it's quite troubling now in terms of a water supply situation this year. We certainly are seeing a very clear signal uh, that we're getting a shift at mid-elevations from snow to rain because of warmer conditions. So that pattern is already evident. Um, I would just note, uh, uh, Dr. Overpeck, uh, that you did mention that the droughts were so much worse in the past than we are experiencing today. And uh, I, uh, while I, I certainly, you know, I, I'm clearly one who disagrees with the idea that we have man-made climate change going on, but uh, why is it, why are you convinced that these droughts in the past had no, which of course obviously had nothing to do with human activity uh, uh, why are you so convinced that today today it's all a result of human activity even though the droughts in the past were worse than they are today uh, good question I uh, in my testimony where I was able to expound on this a little bit longer I tried to highlight uh, that we don't know the origin of the current droughts. We do know that they're being made worse by the higher temperatures. That's causing the rain on snow problem and the early melting of the snow. Uh, that's giving California a little fit this year. Um, but we really don't know the origin of these droughts that are going on now. And that's why I tried to emphasize this idea of a no regrets approach. Okay, I, would su I would suggest that we also don't know the cause of the temperature rise. I uh, Look, I, I have a... Uh, a lot of sympathy with people who say, look, this is what the climate is, and we got to prepare for it because there may be droughts, we need to water, et cetera. But uh, when people have to lace their testimony with uh, a, a reconfirmation of the man-made global warming theory, uh, it doesn't add to the validity here. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, to me, it seems, frankly, it, it takes away from the presentation. One last thing here, and I'd like to note this, uh, 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 and Mr. Levinson mentioned that nuclear energy uses water. Uh, have you looked at the high temperature gas cool reactor, as, uh, which is a new, a new type of uh, reactor, and does that use the same water? Uh, I'm probably not the best one uh, here to talk about uh, about that. Let me know, uh, Mr. Chairman. Familiar. Let me know, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, traditional nuclear power plants do use water, obviously, because they're uh, the, the, based on steam. Uh, there is a, uh, and, and I keep pushing this because I want people to take a look at, at this alternative, there is a high temperature gas cool reactor. My friends who believe in global warming will love it as well, I might add, uh, because it is, of course, clean and does not produce uh, quote, green, greenhouse gases, but it does not use the water that the traditional nuclear power plants do, and I would suggest it is something we should look at because I do understand there is a direct relationship between the amount of energy and water. And Dr. Wilkinson, your, uh, uh, your testimony was very insightful in that. In fact, the desalinization now uh, actually uses less water than we use in pumping water throughout the state of California, and I think that's a significant uh, fact that we need to take into consideration. Thank you very much uh, to the to the whole. Thank the gentleman. I'll uh, fill in for as chair until uh, Mr. Gordon re returns. Uh, recognizing myself for five minutes, do we have a sense of carrying capacity of our country in terms of how big our population can get? Uh, you know, population is growing rather rapidly right now, uh, and we, we're talking about already seeing shortfalls of water. Any thoughts of that uh, in terms of what the trade-offs would be? Do we have some numbers that say if our population grows by X, then we're going to have to reduce water consumption by Y? Any thoughts about that? Dr. Wilkinson? I don't know the specific answer in terms of what number we might uh, 
accommodate. I can't give you those some breakdown. In California, we use about 80% of the water for agriculture and about 20% for the urban system for people directly. In much of the West, it's even more for agriculture on the order of 90%. This varies, of course, tremendously around the country and the type of agriculture and so forth. In California, a lot of the discussion revolves around transfers of water from agriculture to urban. So in theory, one could double the state's population and only take 20% of the water currently going to agriculture. That would leave another 60% still. That's in theory. I'm not sure anybody really wants twice as many people uh, in California or anywhere else. Uh, we have a lot, of, a lot of crowding already. But the transfer of water back and forth becomes, in terms of a limiting factor in carrying capacity, uh, an interesting question. I will say that Los Angeles has increased by one million people in held water use level. That means per capita use has gone down considerably, and that's mainly through these efficiency programs, more efficient plumbing fixtures and the rest. Uh, Mr. Levinson. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. I wanted to mention there is in, in um, our recent report that was referred to earlier uh, a very interesting picture of population growth and water consumption in southern Nevada. Uh, the story there is that the local water authorities simply imposed very draconian measures uh, right at the start of this decade, uh, basically telling people, no, they couldn't plant grass anymore, no golf courses, couldn't draw uh, public water supplies anymore, that sort of thing. Uh, they experienced quite rapid population growth uh, during the past seven or eight years, and at the same time, they experienced a fairly sharp decline in water consumption. So I think that the, the notion that uh, there is a, a necessary correlation between uh, population growth and, and the growth of water consumption isn't right. Dr. Powart. In complement that, um, there has been changes in the efficiency of use. We know that it took 200 you know, tons of water to create a ton of steel years ago. Now it takes three to four. Uh, we're seeing lots of reductions in uh, the per capita use of water. But that does not mean that demand is not increasing because population is increasing even if we're leveling off in terms of uh, per capita use. One of the things we do have to keep in mind when we talk about carrying capacity is also the, uh, we're, we're ingenious. You know, 100 years ago, we talked about some of these issues, and we did have a lot of adaptive strategies in place. Where we're seeing the most immediate threats are in the environmental services provided by the natural environment in terms of recreation, tourism, and the sources of our water supply. That, I think, is, is, will bear the brunt of immediate pressure. We had a, a rather disturbing report here in the D.C. metro area about a month and a half or so ago about contamination of the drinking water, um, admittedly in parts per trillion, but reports of anti-seizure medications, a host of other medications, et cetera. Two questions. How common is this across the U.S. water supply, and what technologies exist today to get us actually pure water? As somebody has twin boys at home and any parent here, you get them water out of the drinking fountain, and you say to yourself, so what meds am I giving my kids today with their glass of water and their sippy cup? Uh, you feel a little bad about that. What, what can you tell us about what we can do to purify the water further and how common this problem is? Well, I don't think we have any experts here on, on that, that side of water, um, but I certainly share your uh, concern as a parent. And I know from my colleagues at the University of Arizona that there's lots we can do in terms of researching out what is in our water and how we then treat it to remove those. Because most of our water treatment doesn't deal with that. And one of the solutions down the road, which my colleagues in California are already adopting, is, is essentially toilet to tap. We're having to use this water that has been used before. Uh, and we will do that more and more into the future. Um, so we better get some research going to figure this out. That's all I can say. <laughs> A more appetizing uh, terminology might help advance that effort. Uh, one last question. We read in some of your testimony about desalinization. What are the adverse, or, or are there adverse environmental impacts to desalinization? If you've got a bunch of, uh, you know, are we changing the mineral makeup of, of the nearshore environment? And any thoughts on that? I'm, I'm particularly thinking about as, as we look at uh, ocean acidification as a byproduct of climate change and the mm -hmm. reduction of available uh, carbonate. Does desalinization also take carbonate out of the, as a mineral, take it out of the system, or? There are two primary concerns 
about uh, environmental impacts from ocean desalination. One is the entrapment and entrainment of marine organisms on the intake side of the equation. Uh, and there are ways to remedy that by uh, drawing in the water through the sand and beach wells and so forth. Uh, but there are concerns about that. And then on the flip, as you mentioned, is discharge, the brine discharge back to the ocean, which is more saline than what was taken out because we're taking some fresh water and then returning a, a saltier mix back in. Some of the solutions to that proposed are to mix that with uh, effluent from wastewater systems, so actually the salinity is closer to the ocean, may not be a bad uh, solution. But both of those are, are challenges uh, for ocean desal. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you uh, to the panel for your insight on the issues. It's interesting. I, I come from rural Nebraska, where uh, irrigation is is very important. Uh, it's actually helping feed the world. I would argue. Heard a little bit about surface storage, uh, Dr. Wilkinson. Would you say that surface storage can uh, perhaps help us uh, mitigate climate change? Surface storage clearly plays an important role already in our water supply systems around the country. One of the concerns with surface storage uh, is the, with, with increased variability in the system, as Dr. Overpeck described, we may need where we have surface systems that are providing both flood control as well as water supply. We may need to hold those systems at lower levels to provide that flood control or take further risks because of pattern changes in precipitation. So that becomes problematic. We would sacrifice water supply and hydropower for those systems that provide those services uh, if we're to uh, operate those systems uh, to deal with increased flood control risk. Uh, the other issue with surface storage. Wait, if, if, if I could have clarification, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to follow you. You're saying that we need to draw down we we'll have to leave more flood control space during the flood in, in because of, of because of change. concerns that we may have strong precipitation events that would fill them up quickly and then spill into flood. And we've experienced some of that. We've had some problems around the country. And so one of the concerns when you have less certainty as to what might happen with precipitation but an increased chance that you may have uh, high precip events, then to maintain that flood control system, you begin to lose, there's a trade-off there, you begin to lose some of that water storage. The other big issue, of course, as Jonathan mentioned, with increased temperatures, we're going to have increased evaporation. And that's actually quite a serious issue with surface storage, uh, especially in arid areas. We're losing a lot of water. Now, that doesn't mean we're not going to continue to use surface storage systems, but we may need to recalibrate our rule curves and our expectations of water supply coming out of them based on climate change. Can you give any numbers for what you think the difference is today? I, I, it's, I think we might be able to agree that climate change is a bit of a moving target in, in terms of defining it. Um, we're even getting away from the global warming terminology and going to climate change based on some of the numbers of, of the last uh, 24 months or so. Um, can you paint a picture with numbers uh, <laughs> easily understood, perhaps, of where we are with surface storage today, where we need to be at, compared to the past 100 years or so? I can't give you a specific number. We need X amount more. Of course, it depends very, around the country what our water supply situation is. Let me suggest two other considerations, though, in addition to and coupled with surface storage, and that is groundwater management. We have tremendous opportunities right now around the country, certainly in, in California, we have huge opportunities to manage groundwater more effectively and to use groundwater storage, as, uh, picture it as an empty bucket underground, uh, storage potential uh, that can be managed. That is uh, an opportunity I think is, is pretty much all agree is, is uh, a priority for water management. Of course, that means maintaining quality of what gets into the ground and what once it's in the ground and maintaining that quality so we don't have the kinds of issues that were just mentioned, the concerns about water quality and, and uh, what's safe to drink. Now you said we needed X amount more of what? You, I, I think you said something like uh, we need I, X amount more. I, I can't tell you exactly how much more surface storage the, the country would need. Um, and part of that would depend on how well we use groundwater and how efficiently we use water 
that would in turn reflect what our surface storage requirements would be nationwide. So I would have to think about it in the context of the demand side, how are we using water, the other options for storage, including groundwater, and then what we need to do with our surface storage systems. I would suggest we need to consider that as a, as a package in an integrated way. And would you suggest that we need uh, more reservoirs? I think in some places we might. In some places there's a serious discussion of removing reservoirs. So I think you probably have everything on the table. Where do we need more? And where do we have systems that may not be cost effective and, and may need to come out? Very good. Very good. Dr. Overpeck. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think what we really are running up against here is we don't have the, the knowledge to answer your questions. Um, we don't know uh, exactly how the water will supply from the atmosphere will change in the future and how the, the demand by the atmosphere in terms of evaporation will change in the future. We need to nail that down and factor that into our models of uh, both above ground and below ground storage. But I do agree with Dr. Wilkinson that uh, below ground storage might turn out to be a much more uh, advantageous approach, uh, particularly in states like your own that have uh, abundant aquifers. We're already doing this in Arizona and many uh, Texas, other states are putting the water underground. And you don't always get out what you put in, but nonetheless, uh, you don't have the problem of evaporation, some of the other problems that are associated with, with uh, above ground storage. And one of the ironies of climate change is that uh, with the probability of increased uh, frequency of drought comes a probability of increased flood as well. This is because the, the hydrologic cycle of the atmosphere is getting accelerated and there's more moisture up there, more energy, and it gives us both extremes in greater frequency. And we're already seeing this around the world. Thank you, Mr. Smith. We're trying to beat a, a vote here. And Ms. Richardson has been gracious enough to yield to um, Mr. Matheson, who has another uh, commitment. And you are recognized for five Thanks, minutes. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I'll, I'll be brief and maybe not use all five minutes. Um, we had a brief, you had a discussion with the Chairman earlier about the bill I introduced, the Water Use Efficiency and Conservation Research Act of 2007. As you probably know, it's going to it would establish a research development and demonstration program within the EPA's office of research development to promote efficiency and conservation I was curious what role that the people on the panel would envision the EPA should have in supporting our long-term water efficiency and conservation effort policies in this country I don't know who wants to answer that. Anyone can answer. Let me just start out briefly. I think that uh, EPA deserves a lot of credit for some very good work over the years. The, the uh, low impact development, some of the slides I was showing, stormwater capture and attenuation of pollution, for example, that they're doing very good work on. And water use efficiency, EPA has done some very good work on. Uh, of course, it's the 1992 Energy Act that includes the the uh, requirements for efficiency in plumbing fixtures, and that has made a huge difference. EPA has, has done a lot to follow up on that. So I think they've already done a lot of good work, and I think it's a, a very helpful move, uh, what you've proposed here, to, uh, to take it a step further. I see EPA as a very visible entity throughout the water supply community. Uh, I see them as advocates as various approaches to water supply and uh, they're out at conferences, they're in regulatory situations, they're in um, planning activities. Uh, there's only so much that they can do, though, to advocate without putting a little money on the table. And their research budget has been cut back so severely in the last few years. They're losing their credibility. I think you've nailed it with this, to give them a little bit of money to push just what, what is needed. I appreciate that. And I noticed in your testimony reports from your organization, Dr. Parker, you, you make a number of recommendations for additional research. Could you maybe offer just your opinion about what, are, what you think are the highest priorities or the most critical areas where we ought to be investing in R&D looking out over the next 20, 30 years for where we want to go? What do you think are the best priorities for R&D on water conservation and, or water use? I think um, I think we need to invest more in dual water systems. Um, I think we need uh, to invest more in the institutional, the science side uh, of the uh, house. Um, it, it's severely ne ne neglected. Uh, uh, Johnson from. Um, 
talking about her concern about uh, human resources. And I, I interpreted it, her concern uh, as uh, being professionals in the field, but then the conversation took sort of the direction of public, uh, the level of uh, how informed the public is. But the truth is, is that um, in terms of uh, having professionals available to address problems and staff agencies and our consulting companies, et cetera, is really uh, in sorry shape. Our, the uh, the uh, dwindling uh, research budget for graduate students in university adequate to produce people that we need in our field uh, just when uh, the problems are becoming most challenging. And the social science side of it uh, has always been uh, Elected. Uh, the, uh, the water policy uh, experts that I know are all in their 60s. No, we're losing the few that we have. So the social sciences, um, uh, innovative uh, supply technologies, conservation, uh, I, I think our hydrologic networks are probably adequate, but uh, they've been allowed to, to be eroded uh, geological surveys limited and falling over no, I appreciate that uh, mr. chairman I appreciate my colleague letting me go and thank you and now we, uh, mr. Um, Hall is recognized for a quick question and then we're going to complete uh, finish up with uh, mr. Richardson I asked the question of uh, mr. Uh, uh, something that's bothered me for a long, long time, and you know, need spawns breakthroughs, or, and wars bring on weaponry like the Manhattan Project and things like that. And shouldn't we be thinking in long thinking in the future of how to save water? And it worries me. Uh, I've been working on a bill trying to put together something for a future a study for the future of working on a bill, maybe even a sense of Congress or something, that, or some study group, when a bottle of water gets to be worth more than a good bottle of beer or, or a bottle of oil, you know, we've got to go to thinking more about it. And I see in Texas and West Texas the rains fall, and in DP and East Texas, rains fall and it goes on down to the sea. Shouldn't we be capturing that some someday, even in a hundred thousand acres at a time, to have it? And, and we don't have that need yet, and it's too expensive now. But I remember when it was too expensive to have a module to for astronauts to escape a shuttle from, and it was, we shouldn't ever think anything's too expensive to save life. But it was also too heavy. Engineers couldn't couldn't prove it, but. Someday, is there's, I'll just leave this thought with you, you gentlemen. Be thinking about a way to giant sumps or something to capture that water and not let it run off to the sea and have it for the time when we have the droughts. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. I think this is an extremely important question as to what mix and types of storage mechanisms that we're, in fact, talking about. And at the same time, have enough of uh, leftover in the system to make sure that the coastal economies that depend on freshwater inflow for oyster beds, mussels, and other things like that are themselves supported as a result. One of the issues we have with withdrawing water for storage is we then increase saline intrusion from salt water into the near shore aquifers. So as long as we're balancing all of those kinds of issues, then I think, yes, storage is one of the options. And we do have to think in terms of groundwater as well, simply because if you can't fill the reservoirs you have, extra storage does not help us. One day I think we'll see those huge metal or otherwise sumps under there. At my age, I don't even buy green bananas, so I don't can't look that far. I can't see that far ahead. But you younger men and this young chairman here, uh, I'm going to get him to work with me on something to set up some kind of a study like that. We've got a plan for 30 years from now. And and I'll just try to stay in Congress that long to see if they carry it out. Mr. I yield back my time. Thank, thank you, Mr. Hall. I've already made arrangements for Mr. Hall to save my obituary. So, uh, <laughs> Ms. Richardson, uh, you're recognized. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Parker, as you can hear from Mr. Hall and our chairman here, uh, you're in need of the next generation of water folks. And as you can see, we've got great folks here that I'm, uh, I'm really concerned of the day when we won't have uh, Mr. Hall here to, to give us good analogies. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to invite uh, you and or maybe one of the hearings we could have in the future would be about desalinization. Um, the largest home of the country's largest and most advanced federally sponsored seawater desalinization research and development project is in my district. And Mr. Wilkerson, I was a little surprised with your comment because back on January 30th, 2008, uh, the Long Beach Water and the United States Department of Interior Bureau of Reclamation um, constructed an under ocean floor intake and discharge demonstration system, which I happen to view because it's right there at the Bluff Park where I walk my dogs on the weekend. And uh, the only other similar facility is in Japan. And I was particularly caught your comment because um, it was founded that essentially the underwater ocean floor intake system, the ecological impacts of entrainment and impingement typically associated with open ocean intakes are avoided with the system, which is what when you were asked the question. And uh, this natural biological filtration process reduces the organic and suspended solids, largely eliminating the need for additional pretreatment, which reduces the overall energy footprint and cost of operation. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with the success of what we recently had. Uh, the project was, um, as I said, recently completed. But I think, Mr. Chairman, it would be well worth um, either one us uh, taking a trip. Uh, we can take a Tennessee guy and, and have you have a real good time in California. Or we could have um, a hearing here. But I think there has been some very recent information. And Mr. Wilkerson, I'm not sure if you're familiar with those results, but they have been substantial to the impacts of uh, being nearly 30 percent more energy efficient than the reverse osmosis technology um, system. So, Just briefly, um, I, I think you're exactly right. The Long Beach project is, is quite good, and the um, Bureau of Reclamation has been helping. My point was that using that kind of an intake avoids the entrainment and impingement. So that is one of the opportunities where the geology supports it to use that kind of system. So I think that is a success, and I think they're doing some very good work in, in Long Beach. So, sir, in terms of, um, you know, funding and research and things that we can do, um, I think it's a valid um, area for us to consider. I, I, I certainly agree. I, I would just talk to our staff and said we need to be sure to get somebody in you know, on a future hearing. And their response was that uh, we've been talking with them extensively, and the term she used of what, what they're doing was uh, fascinating. So um, uh, I, I'm glad that's coming out of Long Beach, and we, we, we want to continue to learn more about it. Thank you. And we I yield are, back the balance of Thank you. We are maybe eight minutes away from a vote. So let me thank our witnesses for appearing here today under the rules of the committee. The record will be held open for two weeks for members to submit additional statements and additional questions uh, that they might have of the witnesses. And again, I will ask witnesses if you would respond to us if you see particular areas of federal R&D. Uh, and also, if you know the particular agency you think that, that where that should be, should be carried out, uh, that would be most welcome and will be a part of our uh, thought process. And this hearing is now adjourned. <laughs>